What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Free Mind Podcast with Dave Hurt. Today is another free solo episode. It is Remember, Remember, the 5th of November. It's Friday, November 5th. And as always in this country, there's a lot of stuff going on. So a little quick update, I guess, on my Instagram censorship slash account disabling debacle. So I submitted my appeal yesterday and a little later in the day, I got a response and it said, basically, we received your response and we cannot reactivate your account. Now, prior to that, I finally, so I attempted to log in to my account from my phone and it actually had changed a little bit. Now it said that my account was disabled for pretending to be someone I'm not. Now, obviously, that's not true. I've never pretended to be someone I'm not. I've always made my own original content. I've never professed to be someone I'm not. So that's patently false. So I submitted an appeal explaining all of that and kind of outlining the fact that I've had a bunch of like imposter accounts made and stuff like that. And so that was probably a mix up and, and, you know, hopefully they can restore my account. But Unfortunately, that's not the case. I received a response basically saying, we cannot reactivate this account because you're in violation of our um, uh, community guidelines or whatever. So it looks, guys, like I am Dave Hurt is (sighs) probably going to be forever gone. So RIP years of posting to that account, thousands of pictures. And I think I was around 40,000 followers. So if you follow me there, please come on over to at the free mind podcast and you can follow me there on Instagram. I'm still on Twitter as at I am Dave Hurt. And then, of course, I have Just Work Co. So the Instagram for that is at Just Work Co. And if you like outdoor content, hunting and fishing and all that fun stuff, which is near and dear to my heart, I do have an account for that, which is at Just Work Outdoors on Instagram. So anyway, that's where we stand with the account deactivation debacle on Instagram. And it looks like they finally got me, you know, for posting crazy controversial stuff about personal responsibility and having an open mind and all that stuff that's apparently frowned upon today. Anyway, I'm not going to let it get to me. You should never put all your eggs in a single basket. And I'm thankful that I'm present on multiple platforms and I don't rely on Instagram for everything. But it still stings a little bit to have built something to a certain size to have it taken away and not given a legitimate reason at all. Anyway, on to what is going on. So first and foremost, you guys may have heard about this, but... Apparently, it leaked, I believe it was through, (laughs) I can't remember originally, I think maybe the New York Times, but the Biden administration had, I guess, conceded that they would be open to paying families up to $450,000 a person of illegal immigrants separated at the border who were in current litigation. So I guess going through the process of what you know, whatever process that is when you illegally cross the border and you're separated from your family. But apparently the Biden administration said they would uh, pay 450K per person, which is obviously a massive sum of money. It's created all kinds of upheaval and people speaking out against it and whatnot. And, you know, there's a couple things to think about here. First off, where does that money come from? That comes from you and me. The government has no money. It takes our money from us and uses it. So taxpayer dollars are going to be used to supposedly give people from families, illegal immigrants, uh, from families separated at the border $450,000. Now, Biden was asked, I think, by Peter Ducey of uh, Fox News at a, at a press conference about that. And and Biden said, no, that's nonsense. We would never do that. And then, of course, the stand in for Jen Psaki for uh, the press secretary, she later on said, yes, we have basically entertained that. So, of course, as always, Biden 
kind of seems lost. He's saying things that aren't true. He's lying about what he said. I don't know. But the administration doesn't have their story together. And the American people are just left to wonder what the heck is going on. So just to put this in perspective, guys, the military members who lose their lives and their families receive a payout from the U.S. government, the amount of that is $100,000 for people who die defending our country. You get four times that if you're an illegal immigrant separated from your family at the border. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people who aren't happy about this, if it's true. Now, again, if it's true, we'll see how it shakes out. But that's obviously something that has a lot of people really worked up, and I certainly don't blame them. Another thing that's uh, been in the news a little bit, I don't know if you guys have watched any of these Senate hearings, but I like to kind of have them running in the background when I'm doing other stuff. Senator Cassidy, and I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure what state Cassidy represents, but in the Senate hearing where uh, the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, and Dr. Fauci were being questioned, he asked her a pretty simple question, a question that you could ask any CEO of any company probably, and they'd be able to give you a pretty straightforward answer. It's definitely something they should know. And she's the director of the CDC, right? So, you know, should probably have a little bit of knowledge about the inner workings of the CDC and her staff there. He asked her if she knew what percent of CDC employees are vaccinated. Pretty reasonable question considering the Biden administration is basically enforcing a mandate through OSHA on companies to get vaccinated on uh, December 4th, I believe it is, is the date. So pretty reasonable to ask the lady in charge of the Centers for Disease Control, presumably an organization that would be the most on top of making sure everyone is vaccinated. Pretty reasonable to ask her what percentage of those folks are vaccinated over there at the CDC. And of course, her response is that she does not know. So that's pretty shocking in a way. It's also not shocking when you think about the fact that these people never have answers to questions. They don't really care about you or I. I mean, again, you ask any CEO of a company or any anyone in a leadership role at a company, they probably have a better answer for you than Rochelle Walensky about her people at the CDC. Also, another takeaway from that is she probably is hiding it because it's probably not a high number or at least not as high as they would want you to think it is. So what does that say? That says that people at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, are skeptical, at least in some capacity, some percentage of the staff are skeptical or hesitant about the vaccine. So it's just something to think about. But that transpired, I believe, yesterday in Senate hearings. So pretty crazy stuff. Uh, New development in the whole Steele dossier thing. I don't know if you guys have followed this, but there was this guy, Christopher Steele, who put together a dossier on Donald Trump basically for the Clinton campaign And a lot of the information in that dossier was used to propel this whole Russia collusion thing. And it's come out since that the dossier was largely false misinformation, completely fake. A lot of it, you know, the whole peeing on hookers thing and all that crazy stuff, it was all fabricated. And and this is not skeptical, uh, you know, pontification. This is like facts that have come forth and there have been arrests regarding this, right? So... Uh, There's been another arrest, I believe, a Russian national, it says, had some ties to the Clintons and um, was part of orchestrating this whole Steele dossier thing. So this is the second person recently who's been arrested as a result of this investigation who had ties to the Clinton campaign. So it turns out that basically in, you know, in just a few words, the Clintons or Clinton, the Clinton campaign, Hillary Clinton, the one who has pushed Russia collusion more than anyone else in terms of saying Donald Trump was colluding with Russia, was actually colluding with Russia, the Clinton campaign. They're the ones who hired Russian nationals to basically put together information that they could use to perpetuate this entire uh, 
rumor against the Trump campaign. And um, the Steele dossier was used by the intelligence agencies to be able to spy on Carter Page, who was working as a part of the Trump campaign. It turns out they knew that it was false and they used it anyway because they wanted to spy on this guy. And then, of course, even though they did, they came up with nothing. Yet that doesn't stop MSNBC, CNN, et cetera, all the talking heads at these mindless organizations from still continuing to push this Russia collusion collusion thing, despite the fact that it was the Clinton campaign literally colluding with Russia. And we know that factually at this point. So that has just happened. And that's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, Alec Baldwin, you guys are probably following what's going on with him, or at least you have some superficial knowledge of what happened. Uh, let me take a sip of this delicious starburst cherry flavored energy drink really quick. Ah, that's delicious. So good. So Alec Baldwin, you guys probably heard on the set of his new movie, Rust, unfortunately, very tragically killed a cinematographer and injured, I believe, another uh, person who was a director on the set. Now, we're getting more and more information about this. Uh, apparently, and this is according to the Daily Mail, they, they put an article out. Apparently, he had, been, he, he had been instructed multiple times not to point his gun at anyone, multiple times, multiple times instructed not to. He did it anyway. And also, somehow, live rounds made their way into the uh, the box of, quote, dummy rounds or blanks that they were supposed to be using. So somehow live rounds found their way on the set of this movie, made their way into the box of dummy rounds, and then made their way into the gun that Alec Baldwin then pointed at the cin cinematographer who he killed after being repeatedly told not to point his gun at anyone. Now, that's pretty dang fishy. Obviously, this is all speculation on my part, but it's not looking good. I mean, this might end up being a lot more than just an accident and just manslaughter. I mean, it's starting to sound like it could be, again, like I said, something more than that. If you tell someone over and over not to point a gun at someone, and look, anybody who has the most basic knowledge of gun safety knows that the number one rule in handling a firearm, if nothing else, is treat it like it's loaded, no matter what. And Alec Baldwin being a vehement uh, opposer of the Second Amendment in general and, and speaking out for more gun control, you'd think he'd educate himself on gun safety if he's going to be handling guns on a movie set. Uh, but again, this just goes to show you that folks will oftentimes speak out against something that they very, very much know little about, right? So it's quite hypocritical. I mean, and that's a big part of the story is that Alec Baldwin is such uh, an anti-gun voice. And then he murdered someone with a gun or took the life of someone with a gun. Um, so that is is ongoing. There was another article on Yahoo News, I believe, where they, I mean, they're really pointing to the, to the fact that it looks like there was some sort of sabotage. And this goes back to what I was talking about uh, in, in regards to the, the live rounds that made their way into the, um, into the, the uh, dummy round box. But also, apparently, there had already been like several accidental or negligent discharges of weapons on the set. So it's just all kinds of fishy, weird stuff going on accidental discharges happening, people warning Alec Baldwin not to point the gun at anyone, live rounds finding their way into the dummy rounds. And then he points and shoots with a live round, a cinematographer on set. And initially when all of this broke, there were all kinds of speculations about um, it was a prop gun. And of course, you know, generally a prop gun is, is still a real firearm uh, and that it was somehow like shrapnel from a camera that had been hit, all kinds of weird, crazy stuff. No, it was it was the fact that a live round made its way into the gun. He pointed the gun at her. He pulled the trigger. He took her life. 
that's what happened. So we'll see what where that goes. Another kind of thing in the news, uh, and you know, I don't know a lot about this guy, but Josh Hawley, um, he's a senator with, I believe, Missouri. And I've started to see him more and more, especially in some of these hearings, really digging into these judicial candidates. And he's an incredibly sharp guy, you can tell, knows the Constitution very well, knows law very well. He recently did a speech at the National Conservatism Convention. I think I got that right, on basically the attack on men in America. And it was really poignant and made a lot of great relevant points. I thought it was it was well done. It speaks to a lot of the negative effects that this uh, wokeism or woke ideology or social justice left, a lot of the negative effects that some of these ideas and ideologies cause, especially on men in America. And you guys know that I've talked about this a lot. Suicides in men are skyrocketing. Uh, men are are really in a state of crisis in America. And it's been going on for a while. It's resulting in, in a lot of suicide and mental health issues and a lot of young boys being made to feel like they're, they're the I mean, the enemy, they're evil, they're terrible for for being men or boys. And Josh Hawley addressed this. Essentially, he he spoke in terms of deconstructing America, beginning with the deconstruction of men. And, And you guys have probably heard in other episodes of this podcast where I had guests on, like, for example, Ian Smith, uh, and we talked about, you know, basically how do you destroy <clears throat> destroy a nation and you start by weakening the strongest links and weakening men in America has has been something that has happened it, and, and it's found in all different areas of life from really sort of demonizing a competitive mindset and and doing the whole participation trophy thing to, you know, telling men that essentially many tenets that one would consider traditional masculinity are bad. And so it results in these young men suppressing their natural urges to, again, be competitive, be dominant, to be what they feel they should be. And this, of course, carries into other areas of their life. It affects their self-confidence. And now we have like super low college enrollment statistics, super high suicide stats, all kinds of mental health crises, young men who are more and more becoming incels or uh, (laughs) involuntarily celibate, right? Who are getting agitated and more and more, you know, mentally stressed and sit around playing video games all day. They feel as though they have no purpose in life. So this is a real issue. And a lot of times when you start to talk about these issues, people will say, oh, boo-hoo, poor men, patriarchy this, patriarchy that. Look, whatever you think, and and we can argue about the existence of of a patriarchy and all of that, but you can't deny the statistics that you see in young men today. And and it's a problem. You know, it's a problem for any group of people to be on a downward trend in so many metrics for being healthy mentally and and socially and physically. So anyway, Josh Hawley does this speech at the National Conservatism Convention. And of course, you see a lot of people on the left talking about it negatively, saying basically the things that I just highlighted, you know, oh, boo-hoo, poor men, you know, masculinity is toxic, get over yourself, that sort of thing. But he touched on some really important things. Again, like I said, more and more men these days are lacking purpose. They're becoming idle. They have really no idea what to do with their lives. And that's an issue. And so I wanted to take this moment to really address men and say, look, if you are feeling that way, and I'm not saying I got it all figured out, but I'm an adult man who's built a business, who's built a family, who's done some things, owned some real estate, all that fun stuff. 
got through college and grad school and stuff, and, and I've made my way coming from very humble beginnings. A lot of you guys know my story, abused by drug addict parents, grew up in a trailer park and homeless and blah, blah, blah. And a lot of what made me attain a level of, if you want to call it success in life, is embracing those characteristics that intrinsically I felt compelled to exemplify. And a lot of those today, again, are considered toxic components of masculinity by many people. Competitiveness, wanting to be the best at something, wanting to dominate something. So don't suppress those those feelings. You know, don't belittle or be mean to others and, and certainly be a good human and try to bring others along with you and uplift others, but also be the best, man. Be the best. So if you need somebody to talk to about that stuff, I'm serious. Reach out to me and I'd be happy to. So one thing I did want to touch on about that, though, is he does kind of uh, indicate that there needs to be some sort of legislative action taken in order to fix this. And and I don't know if, if that's the move. Obviously, that's kind of not in line with conservative ideology. I don't know if it's the role of government to save men. I think it needs to be a shift in the culture. Maybe if you want to have action in, in, in terms of the government, limit some of those things that you have done that have put pressure on young men and, and really demonized young men. But I don't think we need extra programs to say, let's empower men again. I think more government in general is not a good thing. And I think that limiting government and allowing social dynamics to play out is probably the best solution. But anyway, if you guys want to check it out, that's Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri. I believe he's he is from Missouri. And that's at the National Conservatism Convention. So 39% approval rating for Kamala Harris. I was just looking at this. I mean, craziness, guys. It is cr- like these numbers are insanely low. I mean, she's basically mirroring Joe Biden in terms of how many people dislike her. But honestly, what has she done, right? Like, what has she actually done? Absolutely nothing. She was put in charge of the border crisis. The border is an absolute mess, right? She was one of the least popular candidates in the Democrat primaries, had to drop out early. Tulsi Gabbard absolutely obliterated her, and rightfully so, because Kamala did some terrible things in terms of trying to cover up evidence for a, an inmate on death row that would exonerate him. She uh, lengthened out sentences for prisoners to uh, use them for, for cheap labor even longer. She enforced very strict laws on on people for minor marijuana uses, and, and Tulsi called her out for this, yet... Still, despite that and despite the fact that she had an abysmal, abysmal rating, you know, as a, as a primary candidate, Joe Biden, because he was dead set on nothing but identity politics and said no matter who he picks, it's going to be a woman and a woman of color. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad at the job. It doesn't matter if they're liked or disliked. It doesn't matter if they're competent. And that's what you get. You get Kamala Harris. You get a terrible vice president who's doing a terrible job, who hasn't accomplished anything, who hasn't done anything with the work that's been laid out before her and assigned to her by her boss, the president, and is disliked for the most part by most Americans. I think a better question is who the heck are these 39% who actually do approve of her? How can you be approved of if you haven't actually done anything? So anyway, I thought that was pretty amusing, and that's recent news, 39% approval rating for Kamala Harris. I can't remember where that poll was from, but still, wow. We have a president and a vice president who both have sub-40% approval ratings right now. Craziness. Now, on the on the other side of the spectrum, I wanted to talk about Winsome Sears. So you guys have probably seen Winsome Sears in the news. She is the... Jamaican immigrant. She's a black woman who just won the lieutenant governor seat in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And man, what an inspiring lady. Like what an awesome person this is. She has done some interviews, of course, after winning. And 
<clears throat> it's so refreshing to see. It's so refreshing. She is straight up and says, look, I'm an immigrant from another country. I am a black woman and I didn't have to do anything special to end up a heartbeat away from the governorship of the Commonwealth of Virginia as the lieutenant governor. She's like, I stayed in school. I studied. I worked hard. And the opportunity in this country was there for me. And that, my friends, is what it's all about. And that is the truth. Okay. If you don't make yourself a victim, if you just put your head down and work, you can obtain success in this country. Now, (laughs) Joy Reid, of course, I think I talked about this on the last episode. She's one of the talking heads on MSNBC. And in my humble opinion, a complete whack job. I think I said last time, I think she's a more crazy conspiracy theorist nut than Alex Jones is. She, of course, said that the result of this election, this gubernatorial race, was white supremacy driven. Uh, and look, a black lieutenant governor, a female black lieutenant governor was elected. So she was asked about this. She said, look, <laughs> I would love to have to go on to Joy Reid's show if she would have me on. Basically called Joy Reid out and, and, and in no a uh, few words said like i'd like to go debate her if she's brave enough to have me on the show so i thought i thought that was pretty awesome to see her say look this joy reed is full of crap this was not white supremacy i'm a black woman that was elected so just stop already just stop with the race card i i i don't even understand guys how these people can with a straight face say that this is white nationalism or white supremacy when we're electing black women we're electing black women. Well, if you look at the case of Larry Elder in, in California, right, he ran uh, in the uh, in the recall election against Gavin Newsom and, and he was kicking butt. He was growing in the, in the rankings. He was the, the top uh, uh, challenger to Gavin Newsom's seat. And <laughs> there were articles in like the L.A. Times and stuff saying that he was the black face of white supremacy. So it's just almost it, it is actually humorous at this point just how far they'll try to stretch to still blame the white man when we're picking black folks, electing black folks to positions of power in this country. It's, it's absurd. And so it was great to see Winsome Sears challenge Joy Reid to invite her on her show to have a discussion. And I hope, I hope that happens. And ladies, young men too, anyone, white, black, brown, it doesn't matter. Please follow this lady, Winsome Sears, check out her story. Look at what she has done. Immigrating from Jamaica, had three children while she was putting herself through college, you know, tells a story of putting one on the back of her bicycle, riding her bike to make it to class. That's the American dream, man. No matter how much you're up against, if you work hard in this country, you can transcend those limitations because of a system where we're all living based on an ideal. And as long as that's the case, we're going to have millions of people trying to get in this country. We're going to have the most class mobility of any country. We're going to be the most diverse country in the world, the richest country in the world. Stop saying it's so terrible here. Look at Winsome Sears as an example. That's what can happen in this country. Stop listening to this narrative that you're oppressed. Look, my daughter is a, quote, female of color, right? She will be a woman of color. I am married to a person of color, and we have a child together. And I'll be damned if I'm going to tell her that as a result of her skin color, she is disadvantaged in this world, and especially in this nation. And as a result of her her gender, she's disadvantaged. (laughs) Anything but, right? I mean, like 60% of college attendees are female now. So we've got to stop with this. We have got to stop with this. Let's stop creating victims. Let's tell our children that the world is their fucking oyster. And when they work hard and put their mind to it, they can be just like Winsome Sears. And on that note, guys, I think I'm going to get out of here. Happy Friday. Happy Remember, Remember the 5th of November. And I hope you all have an amazing weekend. Until next time, keep your mind free. Peace.